Hi, thank you for coming. My name is Mark Lukowski. I, uh, I'm an engineer on the Google Ajax APIs effort. And I just want to give you kind of an overview and introduction to the APIs and, and point you to some other talks where you can continue to learn about these things. So to start with, uh, you know, what, what are these APIs about? And, and I think the best way to think of these APIs is to first look at what is Google about. And in my mind, you know, Google really is about delivering the web to end users. You know, somebody sits in front of their computer, asks Google a question, we have the web pre-crawled, pre-categorized, pre and we give that user an answer back. He might be looking for a YouTube video, he might be looking for what happened in the world today, uh, you know, in, in Google News, or he might be searching for something to buy or research using web search. But in a nutshell, Google, I think, is all about taking the web, organizing it, and then based on user queries, deliver that slice of the web to the user. The APIs follow that exact same model, but instead of taking that content, taking those search results and delivering them to the user, where the user can read and interact, we take those same, that same information and deliver them to the application. So in this case, the application is doing the query, if you will. Sometimes that query is a, is a result of user interaction on the site. Sometimes it's authored into a page. If the page is about Britney Spears, he might look for YouTube videos about Britney Spears, for instance, and not let you do a search. It's something that the page author controls. But our AJAX APIs are all about taking all the information that we have in Google's data centers that's been categorized and indexed and making that information available to you and your applications. The API is based on a very simple uh, three-level stack. At the very lowest level, there's a RESTful data access layer uh, that features JSON, JSONP, result encoding. The next layer up in the stack, there's a suite of JavaScript objects and JavaScript controls that you can use to, um, you know, if you don't want to go down to the, to the level of XML, HTTP, or dynamic script tag injection or whatever, you can use our our object layer and, and get at the same information. Or you can step up all the way to the top and use some of our JavaScript controls and, and UI elements. And of course, you know, it's a comprehensive stack where we're really building each layer on the layer below it. So you can mix and match, you can, you can do whatever makes sense for your application making use of these three tiers. But at the end of the day, it's really about taking this Google content, Google crawled, Google index content, and delivering it to your to your apps. Now, that RSS icon in the middle, that is representative of our feed API where we deliver RSS feeds or Atom feeds directly to your web app. And you might look at that and say, well, who cares about that? I, RSS is easy to, to get at anyway. I'll just do that one myself. Well, we've spent a lot of money, spent a lot of time and, and energy on efficiently crawling and indexing and categorizing and caching RSS feeds. So as a, as a casual user or even a high volume user, by hitting Google for those feeds, you're getting a cache processed, you know, high quality version of a feed. So it's something to think about that, you know, we don't just crawl and analyze the web, we crawl and analyze RSS feeds as well. So let me do a, just a real quick demo to, to take some of that stuff and, and make it real. I'm just gonna show you uh, a website of one of our customers. This is time.com, and you can see in the upper left-hand corner, let me show you the, the logo there. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, these are Google News results that have been blended onto that page as part of their global business uh, session. So you can see how, in this case, this customer has gobs of content in their own systems, but they also wanted some brand new, freshly crawled and processed Google News headlines that's topical to business or topical to, to a geographic region, and that occupies the upper left-hand corner with a few lines of code calling out to Google. So that's, that's just kind of a real-life scenario of those previous slides. So what I'm going to do today is really kind of walk you through an introduction to the API stack. I'll show you lots of code snippets, but it's not gory, hands-on, all code. I just want to really illustrate how easy it is to get started with these things, how you can you know, do this today 
and blend these onto your sites today. So we're going to talk about the API stack. I'll go over a recent launch that actually happened on Tuesday, give you an idea of our current status, and point you uh, at some resources that you can use to learn some more. So again, the basic blocks at the absolute lowest level, we have a RESTful data access layer that gives you access to all of those Google endpoints, web search, video search, YouTube search, uh, business listings, that sort of thing. Up a level, we have the JavaScript runtime layer, which is a bunch of JavaScript objects that you can use that you know, ultimately drive that RESTful layer, but they give you a you know, higher level of control. And then finally, at the very top, the JavaScript controls and, and UI elements. So let's start with the data access layer. Here, it's, again, it's, it's all HTTP get. It's a very simple uh, URL pattern where, you know, in this case, I'm doing a web search. So you can see at the end of the URL, I say slash search slash, slash web, embed the query in there, and, and I can embed, embed a few other options. But at the end of the day, that's what it takes to get web search, local search, book search, feeds, whatever. It's a simple URL like that. The data that you get back is a JSON, in JSON object that is the answer to your question. In this case, you did a web search. So you can see in the response data field, I have an array of results. And each result contains a URL, a title, a snippet, um, you know, a, a, a visible URL property, a whole suite of properties. But under the covers, it's really this. Now, with a single argument, you can take that JSON response and turn it into a JSONP response. So if you want a callback to happen when the response comes in, you give us a callback argument, and we'll wrap that whole object in a function call to you know, a, a piece of code on your site. Again, you can do this from the server side, if you, if you like, from your Flash environments, if you like. Or you can do this directly in JavaScript uh, if, if you want to you know, get access to a feed or a, a snippet of search very early before the document is ready. You hard code a script tag like that with a callback to a static function, and we deliver the results directly to you. You can learn more about this, and Vadim has a talk uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, A World Beyond Ajax, at Thursday at 11.30 in room 9. It's a, it's a one-hour talk that's all about this data access layer and, and accessing the search API and feeds API and language API from non-JavaScript environments, or speeding up or changing how you actually access this stuff from JavaScript. In addition to that, you can go to the documentation pages. There's a there's a section in each of the APIs on this direct data access layer. Um, you can also go to code.google.com slash API slash Ajax. That's kind of an easier URL to remember. And from there, there's a, there's a uh, click-through link to the various APIs, the feed, the language, and the search API. The next layer in the stack is the JavaScript runtime layer. And, and here we have... Um, each API exposes a collection of objects that are there to make your lives easier, to make you more productive. In the case of the search API, the core object is a searcher object, and we have searchers for blog search and web search and video search. And they, they all expose a, a set of uniform mechanisms, like to do a search, you call the execute method uh, to get your results. You look at the results property. But they also all expose, um, you know, little quirks and controls that are unique to that searcher. Like news lets you have your results sorted by relevancy or by date, where web search only offers, you know, by relevancy ordering. So each of the objects at that layer layer control those those sorts of things. Search API also comes with a built-in search control object. So if you really just want to get, you know, a search box on your site very, very quickly, you can do that using this object layer and have a have search on your site, you know, in, in literally 10 lines of code. The feed API is structured very, very much like the search API. It has a single object, the feed object. It has a, a couple of controls that you can run on the object, like how, how much of a feed do you want? Do you want it in JSON only, XML only, or mix mode? So you control the output format a little bit with that one. And then results are, are uh, embodied in the results object. The language API is probably our simplest API. It's getting a lot of traction, but it's very, very simple. It's a couple static methods in an API class that help you do language translation and language detection. 
directly on your site. So with that, let's just walk through the hello world of, of some of these different APIs. This is the hello world of search, and you can see we start with a google.load command to load the search API. So that's how you get search onto your page. And then um, at the very bottom, I register a callback that says, you know, call that init function when, when you know, the, the page is loaded. I think it's uh, on DOM content ready or whatever is the event that we fire on the, on the, uh, with passing true. But that init function is what, what gets hooked when the page gets loaded by you calling that uh, onload callback function. And you can see the first thing I do is I create a search control object and then I populate that search control object with a web search object, a video search object, a news search object, and an image search object. Then I tell the control to draw itself and I pass it, you know, the ID or, you know, the node of, of an element that I want to draw into. And then I have it execute an initial search. So that's basically the hello world of search. The objects are, you know, more complicated than that. Like web search, you can program in a site restriction or a, a custom search engine restriction. You know, you can you can program the objects before you add them to the searcher. Uh, you code it a little bit differently to do that. But, you know, this is the, the quick and dirty hello world of search. If you want to bypass the search control and do your own thing, process search results, but you want to stick with the object model here, you can see I'm doing the same thing here, only here I'm creating a web search object, and then I'm binding a completion handler to that object. And now when I execute that Google search, instead of the search control fielding the completion and drawing the results, we come into my code, the search complete handler, and it looks at the results array, and, and if everything's good, it just whips through the results and does whatever whatever's right. There's an HTML property for each result if you just want to take that node and clone it and draw it, or you can do your own thing. It's up to you. Uh, but this is just an example of how you can use pieces of the API, but not all of it. You're not limited to a, a search control that looks like ours. You can really do you know, whatever makes sense for your app and, and your site. For the feed API, the same sort of pattern. We have a, a we load the feeds API with a Google.load call. We register a, a uh, an onload handler, and then we're going to use the feed control object here. And so step one is identify the, the couple feeds that I want access to, create a feed control object, um, you know, add some feeds to the feed control, and then draw it. And, then, and what you get is the thing on the right. Now, the, the thing on the right, that feed control, is using our stock CSS styling. You know, that blue is Marissa Meyer approved Google Blue. You don't have to, if you don't like Google Blue and you want something else on your site, it's a simple, you know, one line of CSS override to make that link follow whatever color scheme you like or make the, the time, the, you know, 15 minutes ago, you can, you can suppress that with a CSS rule or you can change the style or you can say, forget it. I don't want to use your feed control. I want to do it all myself. And that would mean using the feed object natively like I've done in this piece of code. You can see on the third line of the code, I create a google.feeds.feed object. So that's my feed object initialized with a URL. If I have some, op some options that I want to um, program to, I can just, you know, feed dot set result limit to, you know, 20 or 4 or 3 or 2, whatever makes sense set the output format, um, but when I ultimately call load, I, I call load on the feed object and I pass it a, um, a completion handler, which in this case is just going to look at, look at the past result, see if there are any errors. If there aren't any errors, then it's just going to iterate over the entry array. You see the for loop there. And then um, this create text node for the title, I'm just going to take the title of the feed and plop it onto my site. So this is a fast, easy, kind of dynamic blog roll with content, if you will. You can have a blog roll on your site that has, you know, this is, the, this is what I follow, and here's three or four posts from, from that blog or from that feed. So very easy to add this sort of thing to your page. And you can either write it out by hand, you can use our feed control, or you can use some of our more advanced controls to do this. The language API, same basic model. I load the language API, 
and then I find some text that I want to translate. I call the translate function, google.language.translate, and I pass it the text. I tell it to auto-detect the source language. I tell it that I want to translate it into English. And then when the translation completes, I want it to call this, this function here. And all that function does is it looks at the translation status, takes the translated text, and jams it into that HTML node. So it's, it's literally that simple. And you know that's kind of the code that I showed in the in the keynote this morning. This is the kind of code that's showing up all over the web. You know when people write a little comment on on somebody's site, if you if they wrote it in Spanish and you only read Russian, some of these sites are now putting a translate this comment, translate this message button up there that takes that text and and translates it. So it's it's a really nice, easy to use API, and it's taking off. It's kind of blowing me away at, at how quickly it's it's being adopted. I kind of predicted a slow growth, and I'll show you later on that it's anything but that. So that's kind of the JavaScript runtime layer at, at hyperspeed. You can learn more about that layer and in Derek's talk. He's going to go into great detail how, you, how to use these objects, how to use the, the native access to build a very powerful um, search feed combo gadget. It's pretty, pretty cool. Take a look at that tomorrow afternoon, 315, room 4. Or you can also look at the API documentation and learn more about the basic objects. The, the area where we're seeing a lot of adoption right now and a lot of growth is, is in these JavaScript controls and UI elements. What, what we've built, we, we almost built this by accident. Really, we built a bunch of samples to show people how to use the search API. And you know, we, we distributed them, and obviously in source form, we encourage people to use them on their site, send us feedback, take the code, change it any way they like. Um, and we really thought that they were just a learning tool that people would take, take onto their site, modify to meet their needs, and, and then use. What we found instead is people were taking these solutions that we wrote as, as samples and saying, hey, it's good enough. I'm just going to slap it on my site. It does everything that I want it, want it to do. So. These things, these things that we thought we were writing as demos to teach you guys how to use this, all of a sudden became you know, the core controls that a lot of people were using. Um, the idea with these things is that they're meant to be useful right out of the box. You don't have to do anything. You, you instantiate a control. You give it the minimum data that, that's needed to power it. Um, and they're functional out of the, out of the box. But you're not done there. You can also use uh, CSS to do deep integration on your site. Uh, they all have a lot of powerful options, whether they're, they're callbacks or enhanced features or hotspot creation, whatever makes sense for the control. They're really designed to look like they're part of your site. They're integrated into, the, into your site. They have full, full power for the rest of your site to interact with them and that sort of thing. They're also perfect for use inside of the gadget environment or you know, the widget environment, whatever you, you like to call those little things. So let me go through some of these things. I'll start with news. News is one of our most popular controls. A lot of people want you know, topical headlines from around the web. You, know, you saw in the case of Time, they wanted global business news on that site. So they're using our news API to say, hey, I want I want my news, but I want it topical. I want it scoped to business news. Um, they're easy to integrate. The, the thing that I showed you on time, that was kind of a frantic phone call during Thanksgiving week where we got a call from time that said, hey, we're launching something on Wednesday, and we just discovered that we have a problem with what, what we were going to use in the upper left-hand corner. Does Google have anything that can help us out? So we pointed them at the news API. And we also offered to get them started. We said, send us a screenshot. Tell us what kind of effect you're looking for. And we'll see if you know, we can help you out with that. So they showed us this, this mock-up that was like you know, nothing for us to code. We've done it a million times before. So we, we wrote the code that night. We sent it to them you know, in time for their 7 o'clock in the morning meeting. They looked at it. They said, this is great. They spent the day you know, testing it, load testing it, and they deployed it the next day. So this thing went from you know, idea to live in two to three days. It's, it's nothing work. And this is on a, on a real site, you know, professionally styled and professionally integrated. So let's look at how these things work. You know, why, why was time able to glom onto it so simply? The basic recipe for the news bar and the news box, which is basically a square version of news or a, 
you know, a, a horizontal or vertical strip is the same. You give the thing, you know, some basic layout options and an array of search expressions or query terms. You supply it with that. You supply it with a set of options. You give it a place on the page to, to load, and you mash those together, and what you get is a, is a box of news on the right. Now, you can style it any way you like to make it match what your site is looking for, but, you know, that's the easy part once you have access to, to news. You can see it live in, in action there in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, it's, it's scoped to wherever you, wherever you click on the map. They change the news on the fly. It's, it's pretty cool. The code behind it, again, I, I said it was simple. You load the search API. You load the news box element. You feed it with, you know, Israel in the, in the business category. And away you go. You have news on your site. The news bar element, this is the thing that actually started the, you know, hyper growth of news is this horizontal strip of, of news. We also have it in vertical form, which I don't have a screenshot of. But these things, we designed those two formats because those are very popular formats for decorating your web. You either have place at the header, between sections, or at the footer for the horizontal treatment. Or if, if you have a, you know, right column, you know, we can run in as small as maybe 200 pixels, 180 pixels to, you know, three, 400 pixels, whatever you have for width in the vertical space. Um, but the idea is I want Google News topical on my site. So here we have superdelegates.org. We're on Ted Kennedy's page, and what the authors of superdelegates.org did is they used the news bar, and they said for no matter which page you're on, the news is always going to be about the person that page is about. And you can see the result, news headlines on Ted Kennedy at the bottom of the page. It's pretty quick, pretty cool. Code, again, literally, you know, we, we actually write the code for you in this case, but the code is, is very simple. You load the search API, you figure out what your list of, of queries are, you tell the news bar to, to go, and, and it'll draw the rest. On the very left-hand side, you can kind of see something that looks like a form. We actually have a news bar creation wizard where you type in the search expressions and, and any kind of title, and then if you hit the show me the code button, we'll show you, hey, take this code, put it on your site, and you're done, and you have news. And from there, it's, it's really a matter of styling it to make it, make it work right for your site, changing you know, the border color or the font or the size, whatever makes sense for you. Feed-based controls, we have, you know, a fair number of feed-based controls um, that, again, are designed for deep custom integration onto your site. Um, we do both text and, and media-based feeds. We have, we have this one control that sniffs out media RSS in a feed, and, and we'll build a slideshow out of that that's pretty cool. We have a dynamic feed control that um, you give a list of, of feeds, and it'll use as much space as you want with dynamic refresh and and everything is pretty cool. And then the partner bar is, is there for cases where, you know, you're, you're part of a network of, of other feeds or partners, whether you're a magazine company or a team in a professional sports league or whatever. You have a case where you have lots of partners that you want to showcase on your site. Uh, we have a control that's designed directly for that. So the feed API, I'm going to... This is a very hard one to do a screenshot on because it's not all in the same place. But if you go to any one of the New York Times blogs, if you look in the right, right margin, they have about 280 to 330 pixels of space in the right margin. And they have, they have some ads in there. They have you know kind of a blog roll in there. And hidden in there is also a use of the feed API, where in this case, um, they're looking at, late, at a, at a feed of latest technology headlines, and they want to expose those in the sidebar of the blog. So the highlighted area, that's directly out of, out of their blog, and these are a couple technology headlines that, that they've gotten out of a feed that they want to expose on their site. The cool thing about it is you would never know that that's powered by Google or powered by our APIs unless you opened up Firebug and actually looked at what's going on. Because for this API, there are no logo or branding restrictions. Um, the only restriction is, you know, the basic terms of use, how you, how you use it. But you can do insanely deep integration and nobody even knows about it. In this case, the, the guys that worked on this project at the New York Times 
they're kind of at the CSS, HTML level. They're very high in the, in the stack as far as their um, web serving infrastructure goes. So it, w it was just simply not possible for them to, you know, knock on the door to the basement where they keep the Java programmers and say, hey, could you guys sneak this into the template or do this XML, HTML request thing for us? They, they just said, forget it. I'm not going to go downstairs and even ask for them to say no or tell me nine months. They, in an afternoon, they said, let's just open up the template for our blog, put in a script tag, put in, you know, 20 lines of code to fetch, a, fetch it and render it like this, and they're done. They don't even have to tell the guys downstairs. So they love this kind of stuff, and I think that, you know, in a lot of organizations, we see that dynamic played out over and over again. So the feed API in the Times, you'd never know it's there, but the code under the covers is no different. You load the feed API, you create a feed object with a, with a feed URL that you're interested in, you set, in this case, the number of entries to three. You call load. When the load completes, we render those results. So that's, that's as easy as, as it gets. I mean, 90% of the work, I think, is in the CSS and the layout, not in accessing the data, where that used to be the hard part of it. The slideshow element, this is actually one of my favorite controls. Um, what you do is you, you deliver it, you give it, either a feed or an array of custom objects. It supports several callbacks. You can, you can hook a lot of activity to what's going on in this thing. But it's there to, you know, sniff out the images in, in the feed, or you can help with a URL resolver. And it manages the transitions between, between images. And you see this effect over and over again. Look at the upper left of most content sites that have a lot of photos, and you'll see a photo control, big, big photos, a little cursor on the bottom, and maybe a snippet of the story that relates to the image. You guys all know what I'm talking about. That component exists. Our slideshow is the core component that organizes the transitions from, from image to image, gives you a callback when there's a transition so you can render the stuff that's related to that current entry. It's very programmable. We use it in a lot of situations. Like here, we've got it in you know, this, this, uh, the Prince bike over there. That's just a regular slideshow. The, the, only hooks on that are navigating forward and backward through the suite of photos. Uh, we use it in gadgets, and the Real News Network has built a very cool video play gadget, and they're using it to transition between different media thumbnails, and when you click on, on the play button, it plays the video directly in the page. Uh, the People Top 5 Celebrities, again, we're reading five entries out of a Top 5 Celebrity feed understanding the custom markup for the, for the ranking, and we switch the images and the title and the snippet, you know, all, all synchronized through the slideshow control and through the events that it, it calls out with. In the lower left, there's a YouTube channel gadget where we, you, you uh, feed it the name of the YouTube channel, like the NBA or CBS or the McDreamy, McSteamy, uh, Grey's Anatomy channel or whatever. We pick up the color scheme of the YouTube channel, and we give you a, uh, a control that is selected thumbnails from, from the YouTube channel with the right color scheme with click to play directly on the page. And again, you can use that as a standalone gadget like we've shown it here. You can build it into a gadget or you can put it on your site, whatever makes sense for you. Again, the, the code is incredibly easy. You load the feed API, you load the slideshow element, you uh, tell the slideshow, you, you create a set of options that might include the callbacks that you're interested in, uh, the number of results that you're looking for, and then you tell it to go, and, and what you get is a slideshow control on, on the left, the image control, with enough callouts for you to do this other effect, the related headlines effect on the right. Very easy to use. The guys at People were just blown away about how easy this was to integrate onto their site. I mean, the guy said literally minutes to get this up and running. The partner bar, yeah, this is a, a text-based control. And again, you see this pattern all over the web. You know, if you're part of a, a network of blogs, you'll usually see a sidebar or a uh, footer that says, you know, read more from, from this blog or, you know, check out this, this headline or, or that partner. Um, so we built something that's, that's designed for exactly that kind of 
use. It uses a float layout inside the box. So you can get this rectangular effect, the strip effect, the footer effect, whatever makes sense. You can have the headline or the title of the blog be um, a background image, or it can be a text, or text, or it can be text with a with a subtitle, whatever makes sense. But the idea is is that the partner bar object takes an array of, of feeds. Uh, it, it's all based on CSS layout, so you can make it look any way that you any way that you need it to look. If if you you can tell it to render three elements out of a pool of nine and pick them linear, pick them you know first in, first out, pick them randomly. Um, every 13 seconds, switch to another set. You know, it's got a ton of options that let you highlight your partners in a small amount of real estate and get, you know, very professional results out of it with basically no work on your part other than to say, here are my partners. I partner with this website, this website, this website, and that website. So if you're, you know, if you're part of a sports league, you know, if you're an NBA team, for instance, you might want to show things from the league, things from your divisions feed, things from your team, and something from your competitors. And you can have that strip at the bottom of your page very easily. These are some, some live partner bar examples. You'll see them at the bottom of lots of the Google blogs. We're kind of rolling this out in phases, but at the bottom of a lot of our Google blogs, you'll see something that looks like this thing on the, on the lower right where we're selecting you know, the top three stories from each of the Google blogs with titles and subtitles. That's very easy to use. If any of you guys are interested in putting Google blogs on your site because you're Google fans, we have the list of, of blogs out there and you can just create a partner bar and, you know, two lines. You don't even have to spec the partners because we already built that array for you. You just select which ones you want to you wanna list in there. Uh, the large horizontal one that's at the bottom of... Um, entertainmentweekly.com. Again, they, they started this project with us. They said, hey, we've got this vision of this thing at the bottom of our site. The guys in the basement said it would cost us, you know, $30,000 in budget and take six and a half weeks, and did we want to move forward with it? So they called us and said, what can, can you help us? And we said, yeah, we can do it in three days for free. Is that good? And <laughs> they jumped all over it. So anyway, but it's, it's the right thing for, for a site like that to actually – you know, you have to be able to move at internet speed if you want to be in the game. And, you know, going down to the basement every time you have a request for your site is not going to work. You're going to run very slow at that rate. The code behind it, again, very simple. You can see I, I create a set of an options array that says, you know, our title is from our Google blogs. I want to see three entries, select nine partners at random, auto refresh, and do it every 10 seconds. And boom, there you go. The list of blogs in this case came from, from Google, but if you had the list of feeds, you, you'd do it on your own. Video is another, you know, crazy, crazy um, service for us. Uh, we have a, a couple of controls that, you know, started out really as samples. We want to show people how to do video search, but to do, you know, in-page play and, you know, tile videos and that sort of thing. Um, so we built a small set of controls, the video bar control, the YouTube uh, gadget, and the, the video show thing behind the YouTube gadget. Uh, it's all stylable via CSS, search-based video selection. So instead of, you know, you picking, oh, I want that video and that video, you select your videos through search. And, you know, it could be a generic search term like sports car, or it could be a very specific search term like the NBA YouTube channel. So you can, you can basically camp on a channel, you can do a search, you can camp on, you know, some of the YouTube, you know, most viewed feeds for this month, today, this year, whatever. So we have a number of those feeds that you can use as query expressions, and you can also just do a, a raw naked search and get what you get. Um, it's, it's actually very powerful. Let me show you a couple of these things. Again, the basic recipe is a list of query expressions here. I'm just doing, you know, stock, regular old, you know, people name queries. I could have gone directly to Barack Obama's YouTube channel if I wanted or Hillary's YouTube channel, but, you know, for the sake of the demo, just, just keywords. So you supply a set of query expressions. You supply a set of options for the video bar, like do you want it horizontal, do you want it vertical, do you want four results or eight results, you know, what do you want, where do you want the player, 
Do you want the player to position itself near the bar automatically, or do you want to, do you want the player to always run in that cell? You have that option. If you have multiple video bars, do you want them to share the same player real estate so they compose nicely with each other? Um, and if you want, and you saw in my keynote, you can also support manual queries. You know, you can put the video bar of you know the Brock videos that you wanted, and if you want to have hyperlinks on your page that that impact that strip of videos, you can do that. Or if you want a search box directly below it, you can put a search box in there and, and accept manual queries. It's up to you. These are some of our video controls in, in the wild. You can see, you know, in the upper left, uh, the channel gadget inheriting the uh, the channel of I, sol soldier. I don't know if it's soldier boy or soldier boy, whatever. But that channel, we picked up his background, his videos, his music. It's a great way for that channel to kind of syndicate itself out in the wild, where his brand kind of goes along with his videos. Uh, in the center of the screen, that's just kind of a, a New York in the news site, and they have some videos of Times Square that they're showing. Um, up in the upper right, we have it baked directly into Blogger, where if you have a Blogger blog and you want you know, this kind of video effect on it, it's literally one-click addition in Blogger. And, and I show that not, not to show really that, oh, Google's cool. If you put your blog there, you can get videos. It's that we did that to our product. We, we recognize the value of videos in the blogging environment. We own Blogger. We put that in. If you guys work on some of the other blogging platforms or content creation platforms and you want to treat your users to something that I think they'll really latch on to, follow the lead and put up a little, little tiny wizard like this that lets them say, I want videos on my site and I want them you know, to, to match these terms or glom onto these channels. And you'll be amazed at how many people adopt that. It's crazy. The code, again, very simple. You uh, load the search API, you load the, the video bar control, you come up with the options and the query expressions, and you put it on your page, and the next thing you know, you have, you have videos. Here we also have a wizard to help you out. You, know, you pick the orientation, popular channels, YouTube channels, search expressions, and once you're done with all that, you know, we're showing you what's the impact in real time, you know, what the videos are and that sort of thing. Once you're okay with it, Hit the customize button. We give you the code. And once you have the code, you're on your own. You do whatever you want. You can style it. You can change the search expressions. You know, whatever makes sense for you. But it's, it's trivial to do, and there are millions of, of people doing this. GeoSearch is another big area for us. Uh, we have, you know, some very deep custom integrations with the Maps API. And, and, you know, again, we enable that deep integration to go all the way down to your website. We have support for KML search. It's in its infancy right now. It will get, it will only get better. I mean, it can't get any worse than it already is because out of KML, what we're really giving you is a title, latitude, longitude, and a content snippet. We're going to be expanding on that to give you the full HTML of the KML. So you can do some really cool um, KML-related mashups just by using the search API to find the overlays that make sense in the in the viewport that you're currently looking at. So take a look at some of the solutions that we built for for Geo. Um, but I want to show you again the recipe in in almost all cases is very simple. In in this case, you have if you have a map in hand and a set of options in mind, you give us both of those pieces, and we'll create a searchable map for you. And all we're all we're doing is you know. When you, when you do a search and when that search completes, we're going to go dump some markers on the map for you and we manage the state of those markers and we put them on and we take them off under control of the, of the search box that you've put on the page. Um, did I show you the code? No, I didn't show you the code for that. Let me show you a couple samples. First, I'll, I'll show you three basic samples. They're, they're all using the search API slightly differently. On the right, the map search gadget that we have is kind of a slimmed down version of Google Maps. It's a map that you can, you can keep on your home page with a search box in it. I use it as a phone book. Like, I, I don't remember the phone number of this sushi place. Um, and if I want to call for a reservation, the easiest way for me to do that is to go to my home page, type in the name of the restaurant, and, and boom, up pops their, their site and their phone number, and I make the call. 
Kayak is using it. Um, you can see in the lower left-hand corner, there's a search box. That's actually something called the Google Bar that, that is part of the Maps API that uses our search system. And then Walk Score on the far left does a bunch of searches to figure out the walkability of your house. I mean, how green is your house? How many times are you gonna have to jump in your car to get a quart of milk or you know, pick up a box of Thai food? So if you're, if you're in walk score and, and you got a score of 38, you're probably walking a lot. If you live in New York City and you have a score of 98, you're, you're probably right around the corner from just about anything that you could imagine. The code, it's literally, it's that simple. If you have a map in hand, and you want your map to be searchable, all you do is call map.enableGoogleBar, and we've taken care of the rest. You can program options if you like, set custom markers, whatever makes sense, but if you want search on your map, take whatever map application you already have, add one line of code, map.enableGoogleBar, and now your map is, is searchable, like you've seen in the examples and like you see in the lower left-hand corner. The Language API, this is one of our most recent launches. I think, when did we launch this one? In April? Yeah, right, beginning of April. So very new, you know, very, very rapid adoption. Uh, it lets you translate short snippets of text or HTML. <coughs> we do automatic source language detection, so you can, you can say, I don't know what, what the language of, is, of this text is. We'll figure it out and we'll translate it to the target language for you. You can learn more of that by going to the uh, Ajax language API page, or you can see it see it in action. Dion, uh, I don't know if you saw the state of the Ajax talk, he wrote a really cool um, bookmarklet that calls the translation API on, on your behalf, so you select some text and hit the translate link and it'll put up this little pop-up window. So you can see, I went to the French BMW site, selected the, the text that I, I didn't know what it said, but I knew what it said. Um, and then translated it, and you can see, welcome to the official website of BMW France. Please select the version of the site. So it's a cool little bookmarklet when you bump into the wrong site or, you know, you want to understand, you know, this is one of my customers. They're complaining on a forum. I don't even know what they wrote. They wrote their message to me in Italian, and it looked like they're frustrated. How can I translate that? It's, it's very easy. You can, you know, select the text, hit the translate bookmarklet, and you'll see it in real time. We've also built a little Facebook application as a sample. Uh, in this case, it lets me post on somebody's wall in whatever language I chose. And, and here I've got this little deal with Hannah Schultz, my friend, who I had to tell her that I dropped my iPhone because she's next in line for that phone when I retire it. So I, I was apologizing to her that I dropped her phone, but she'd have it hopefully by the end of uh, the month of June. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you is this chart that I kind of snuck into in here. And this, what I'm showing here in this chart is API adoption. The red line at the bottom that goes up and stays flat, that's a typical API launch. So and I kind of like that shape. I like it because it lets us say, okay, we got out the door, things are going smoothly, let's not ramp up the volume until we've watched it for a little bit. So that's an actual live launch of a, of a Google API that launched very recently. Overlaid on the same time scale is the take up adoption of the feed API. That's the green line. And the feed API really blew us away by how quickly it was adopted. So that's two weeks of, of adoption of the feed API. And you can see, it, you know, it's, it's on a healthy uptake. This is a year ago, so that's not the sh shape anymore. It's a little bit steeper now. The blue line is the language API. And this was an API that literally, I, I kind of fought with the guys on our team saying, God, nobody's going to use that. Who's going to use that? And what are they going to use it for? And boom, I mean, it's near vertical out of the gate. It's, it's phenomenal how quickly these things take off. And I think they take off because we've hit the sweet spot in how you want to use this sort of thing. We've made them very easy to use. There's not a lot of setup work on your part or tips and tricks. It's like, hey, I want to translate some text. How do I do it? Boom, include the language API, give us the text, tell us who to call when we're done. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. And you get a blue line when, when you do that right, in the right space. The code for this is, again, very simple. Load the language API, give it some text, tell it to translate, and call this function when you're done. That's, that's all you have to do to mimic this. Obviously, 
um, that google.language.translate call is, is nothing more than a JSON request under the covers using the RESTful data access API layer. So you can either write it like this or you can write it from your server or write it from JavaScript using, you know, uh, what is jQuery has a JSON P call. You can use J, jQuery natively if you like to do that. So easy to use. Our newest addition, and this literally, I don't, I don't even know how this came together so quickly. Um, we had an offsite a little while ago where we said, hey, what, you know, what are some cool ideas we can, we can do for the JavaScript community? And we decided that one thing that we could do at Google is we could host all these libraries that people are using. Uh, jQuery, Prototype, Scriptaculous, MooTools, Dojo. It's a bunch of very common libraries. And none of those library providers are hosting them. They, they put the code out there for you as a developer to copy to your site and, and host on your own. Um, we decided that we could complement some of what AOL is doing by, by hosting Dojo on their CDN. We could do the same thing for Googlers, for Google API users. And, and so we launched uh, support for these public popular Ajax libraries. They're available, you know, available globally with high speed, low latency. We've got multiple data centers, multiple machines around the world serving these things. And, you know, it's, it's something that's very, very easy for us to, to do and, and kind of out of reach for most websites. So we're doing that. We uh, emit proper cache controls and proper cache headers, minified libraries when they exist. And, you know, we're committing to host, host these old versions forever. So I said <coughs> we do jQuery 1.2.3 and 1.2.6. That 1.2.3 will be here 10, 10 years from now if you're still stuck on that release and, and want that release. I'm not sure that jQuery is going to still have that release on their servers 10 years from now. They might not be even be around, or they might have been morphed into something else. But our commitment to you guys is that once we put one of those libraries up there, it's up there for life. So that's one of the cool things that we've just launched. And again, adoption of this is is kind of crazy. I didn't know what to expect, how, you know, it takes a code change. Will people do it? And sure enough, I mean, we launched it on Tuesday morning with a blog post, and boom, you know, we were doing four or five QPS on prototype alone within minutes of launch. Current status, where are we? Um, uh, service is growing, and, and it's scaling very, very well. We've, we've gotten, uh, you know, a bunch of perf improvements in there. Our typical request latency is sub-100 milliseconds. We've got adoption at, you know, across the board. You know, sites that are doing, you know, lots and lots and lots of page views per, per day down to blogs that you wonder, why are you even writing this? You're getting no readers. I mean, two, three, four page views a week. It doesn't matter. It's across the board, the adoption. Um, this, is, this is kind of a year. If you look back from, from last May to this May, this is kind of the shape of our curve. That spike in the middle, anybody have an idea what that might be? So that's what happens when your API is used on the home page of YouTube. So that spike represents all of the home page traffic of, of YouTube for about a week. You know, where the, we, what happened is we, we were on one of their blogs. Our API was being used in a blog post. And the way that their site works is the most recent blog post is also on the home page. So all of a sudden, you know, we get into, into work and our pagers are going off. High QPS alert, you know, this is going, going crazy. And we look at it and it's like, oh, it's just YouTube. You know, we're, we're on the cover of YouTube. So anyway, you can see from the, from the peak of that, that, that's what YouTube is, homepage of YouTube. And this is where that API is. So it's generating, you know, a lot of traffic. Overlay it to the Maps API year one. This is just a, you know, showing the different rates of adoption. The blue line is the first year in the life of Maps. The red line is the first year in the light in the life of, of Ajax Search. You know, obviously Maps launched a year before we launched, so it shifted. But that's how quickly the Search API and the Feed API and the Language API are taking off relative to Maps in the same time frame. So that's, that's an idea of where these are going and how broadly they're adopted. And then I, I overlaid them on the same time scale so you can see how the red line caught up, passed, and now it's basically on, on par with each other. So everything you know about the Maps API and the success and the popularity of that API, you can kind of back map it and say, wow, the search feed language API, the Ajax APIs are 
maps times two effectively in terms of uh, rate of adoption. For popularity, who's using what? YouTube is by far the most popular, accounting for about 33% of our traffic. People doing video searches using that video bar. Google News is, is right up there, you know, and it, it, news has never passed YouTube. I expect it to pass soon. Feeds is, is up there doing 20% of our traffic and web search about 7%. So news and video and, and feeds are at the very top of our adoption list. In terms of controls, that local search control for Google Maps is as big of a home run as you could, you know, ever possibly hope for in terms of a, a control or a widget. The news bar control is very popular. The video bar control is, is very popular, you know, and with the bloggers and some of the other sites. And then the slideshow control is kind of sneaking up on everybody because it's so programmable and it's at the foundation of anything that we do with, with media. Where can you go to learn more? Go to our documentation pages. Uh, they're written by engineers, so if we use the wrong words and the wrong grammar occasionally, forgive us. We're, we're really going for accuracy in these technical documentation. So uh, take a look, join us on the forum, let us know what's going on, and definitely make sure to check out these other sessions. The Vadim's talk on accessing the API from Flash and other non-script environments, and Derek's talk on gadgets and UI development. And with that, it, at the end, I have a time for a few questions. Um, I think they've asked me to step up to the mic. Oh, wait, I should do the housekeeping stuff first. Please announce at the beginning of the session. <laughs> Apparently, there's feedback forms at the when you leave. You can fill out those feedback forms, and then lunch is on level three, and it's being served until 2:30. So, if there's any questions, please come up to the mic and uh, throw us your questions. Yeah. They're, for, for that application, they're using the feed API. Because okay. they're, they're pulling headlines from, from their own network. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, what determines uh, the drive towards a certain API? Is it the user feedback or just the engineers sit down and say, this is what I want? <laughs> I think the question is, how do we shape the API? And it, it's really both. It's, it's us thinking in terms of, you know, what do we need to solve a particular problem? What are people asking for in the forums? But like the video bar control was really designed by one of you. It gave us feedback that says, hey, I like what you did with this one video search control, but really what I'm looking for is a strip of videos, and I, I don't know how to code it. Can you help me out? So that was kind of a user-initiated thing. But we take feedback in the forums, and, you know, we react very quickly. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I just have a question about your language API. Did you get any feedback? Because if I see uh, the translations, it looks more like it is translated one-to-one -one the word. It's not really a translate. I mean, that's the lack of yeah. every, every translator, right? Yeah. So it um, you have a great usage of it, sure, but do you get any feedback what the people are saying, what the developers are saying about that? Yeah, I think it goes both ways. I think that <coughs> the longer the sample, the better the translation. But at the same time, we're limiting you to, to you know, a 500 character, very short snippets of text. So the translations are not, they're not as good as what you would get if you hired somebody to do translation by hand. But for the casual use cases that people are using this for, like I'm trying to have a short conversation with somebody in a different language or post a message or ask a question on a non-native language message board, it's, it gets the point across and it's, it's good enough if you have enough content, but no, it's not perfect. It's machine translation. So do you do any further investigation about that? What's that? Do you do any further investigations? Yeah, yeah I, I can't talk about some of the futures, but one idea that we, that we have and that is coming to our language teams is some, some notion of feedback. You know, I did this translation. This is what I thought of it. Here's the correction. You know, so we'll incorporate that into our learning algorithms to make the translation better. But, but the thing about this translation is this is the same core translation logic that we use inside Google when we're indexing and categorizing the entire web. So we take a, a page and, and we 
run it through our translation engine, the same one that we've exposed to you here through this API. Yep. Um, on the, the language API, is, are there any plans to increase the limit from 500 characters? <laughs> it's it's not, not particularly long. Well, let's just say that there's been a lot of people asking for that feature. So, you know, whether or not we listen or not, <laughs> that's, that's up to us. But a lot of people have asked for it, and, and we just have to think through what the ramifications of, of increasing that are. Should we take fragments? Should we, you know, what, what do we have to do to really meet the needs of the developer community? And, and I think we have a pretty good track record of hearing and listening. Sometimes there's a long delay uh, between, you know, your perception of did, did we hear you or not. So in this one, I hope we can move quickly. I'm, I'm, I, I don't have a target, but we've definitely heard loud and clear that people would like longer translations. We're not trying to be a service that says, give us your website, we'll translate your website. There are services like that exist. We're trying to help you with the problem of runtime translation. So different dynamics in, in play, different latency requirements. Yeah. Okay. Okay, one more and then I'll take them outside. Have you heard of any language, um, client-side uh, parsers for HTML contextual, you know, tear aparts for, you know, putting, th putting the uh, contextual text back through the translator? Like, you know, basically a DOM parser that can go through and parse out the, the raw text no, I, I haven't heard of an automatic tool. I mean, I, you know, it's just code, though. So I'm sure people are using that. We're it's, working on that. It's really yeah. funny when you put HTML through there. And, well, and no, we, we'll take your HTML. We'll translate your HTML and oh, give you yeah, back yeah, HTML. It. It, yeah, that capitalizes uh, the first character and a brace. And yeah. that's weird stuff like that. Okay. Thanks.